So it is my honor now to announce the opening keynote of our conference, which will give an overview of two of the central topics that we'll have today. Um, the keynote will be covering issues connected to the topic of internet freedom, which is one of our three central areas, as I mentioned this morning. And also we'll touch on points of how political action can be translated into political impact. And I would like to now introduce the wonderful Gillian York, who will be holding this keynote. Gillian is the director of Electronic Frontier Foundation for International Freedom of Expression. Um, she specializes in free speech issues in the Arab world and also on the disruptive power of global online activism. Please give a warm round of applause for Gillian. <laughs> So that was a really tough act to follow, um, but I must say, I think my, my usual nervousness is, is gone now. So I thank you so much, uh, wherever you're sitting. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, as Geraldine mentioned, um, I work for an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is, I think, uh, the oldest digital rights organization in the US. Um, and like she said, my focus is on um, freedom of expression around the world. And so I've been thinking, in preparing for this, I've been thinking about censorship and what it does to us and what it does to our societies. And I think we all think of censorship as a terrible thing, and, and that's good. <laughs> I'm glad we do. Um, but at the same time, I was thinking about the name of this conference and about how censorship also can have the effect on a society of energizing it and mobilizing it. Um, and so we've seen over history, we've seen cultures in which art has flourished under censorship, which literature has flourished under censorship, um, and music even. And so I think that it's important to remember that that exists. Um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about how activism uh, in the 21st century um, has flourished in some places under censorship and how we can take that and use it to create action. And forgive me for just a moment, I'm going to open this bottle of water before I start. There we go. So first though, I want to ask from the audience, please raise your hand if you live in a country where the internet is censored in some way. In, even if it's just one website. <laughs> okay, wait, let me try this again. Let me try this a little differently. Raise your hand if you live in a country where the internet is not censored. Congratulations. I, I'm, I'm sort of half raising my hand because I don't really believe that about my country. <laughs> cool, okay. So then you'll all pretty much, will all understand what I'm getting at. Um, so Tunisia, do we have any Tunisians in the audience? Ah, welcome. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Tunisia and you can hold me accountable if I say anything incorrect. Uh, <laughs> so uh, several years ago, I think it was 2006, um, a, a blog collective called Noat, uh, created, which unknown at the time, created this video. Um, and I don't have it with me, but I, I suggest, you know, I totally recommend looking it up later. Um, but this video was based on a 1984 Apple computers advertisement. I think some of you who are old enough which is probably not that many, might remember this ad, um, <laughs> where you had this woman kind of taking this, this hammer and throwing it at the screen and smashing, you know, essentially smashing the, the state. And that was the idea of this. And this group in Tunisia, Noat, uh, took that advertisement and remixed it so that you had someone throwing this hammer at Ben Ali. And it was beautiful, it was a really, really beautiful ad. And actually, two years after that, um, someone in the US did the same thing uh, around Hillary Clinton during her bid for president. I think they copied Noat. Uh, but anyway, my point is, this was this beautiful remix, this beautiful digital remix of um, an, an advertisement into political activism. And as a result, um, well, nothing happened immediately as a result, but over the years through that buildup um, that they and other groups created, you ended up with a strong community that was anti-censorship in addition to the many other things about their government that they opposed. Um, another wonderful example from the same collective, and this is my favorite. Uh, so, 
Some of you may have heard this little story about uh, the former president's wife and how she liked to take elaborate shopping trips to Paris and other places. Well, <laughs> so some people uh, from this group and elsewhere saw um, on the internet, there, there are these websites that you can look at where it shows uh, the locations of airplanes. And they noticed that the presidential plane was taking trips uh, to places where it was not authorized to go, usually Paris or other wonderful European cities. And so they started mapping this uh, and basically realized that uh, these are all unauthorized shopping trips. Uh, Foreign Policy magazine in the US did an article about it. It got some mainstream media attention. Um, and this was just something that a couple of people did to make a point. Um, and so my point in that is that Google Earth ended up being blocked, right? So this happened in other places as well. <laughs> but the point is, you take an action, and then that action can sometimes result in censorship and then empower people even further. So I want to give you a couple more examples of that. Um, China, Who's, is anyone from China? No, no one from, Ch sort of, okay, cool. Sort of from, Ch I, I understand that. So in China, where the internet is probably the most censored in the world, um, if anyone disagrees with that, we can have that conversation later. Okay, fair enough, but probably the most censored in the world. Um, censorship has created a new language. So uh, has anyone ever heard of the grass mud horse example? Okay, cool. So I'm probably going to get this story totally wrong, so I'm glad that only a few of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so the grass mud horse is an animal that I think kind of looks like a llama or an alpaca. And apparently the Chinese word for it also sounds like a profanity. And so grass mud horse is now used to basically insult the state in this very secretive and, and kind of uh, coded way. And there are all sorts of other examples like this where if you can't say something because it will get blocked, you say something else in code. Um, and that's kind of a beautiful example because it's allowed this, this secondary coded internet speak to flourish. Now, I'm not saying censorship's a good thing. I'm saying that this has created and politicized people who may not have otherwise become politicized. Um, and there are examples like this from all over the world, but I won't bore you with all of them. So what I saw in Tunisia and what I've seen in other countries is that when you have this heavy censorship from the state, it often results in energizing and mobilizing, for lack of better terms, <laughs> and politicization. Um, and that's kind of a fascinating phenomenon to me. Uh, right now, I think that more than... I want to say like something like 40% of the world's internet users uh, experience some kind of censorship, and that number is from two years ago, and I'm guessing it's gone up significantly. Um, and this is an increasingly uh, complicated phenomenon, um, and not just censorship. We also have extensive surveillance, which I'm sure a lot of you know about because there are so many of my, my people in the room, people who work on these issues. Um, and so under this, we've got two choices, essentially. We can live with it. We can live with the status quo and watch it get worse, or we can fight against it. And I think that's what a lot of you are doing here, fighting against it. But that doesn't always mean a negative fight. Sometimes it means art. Sometimes it means subversion. So I'll give you my favorite example from the past couple of years of how this happened. So um, who's heard of ACTA? Cool. Who hasn't heard of ACTA? <laughs> Jeremy, that's a lie. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but we, we kind of have the guy who like maybe sort of helped kill ACTA, so... <laughs> I'll let him tell that story, though. Um, so, you, ACTA, who's heard of SOPA and PIPA? Okay, cool. Yeah, who hasn't? Exactly. So, uh, SOPA and PIPA were these two ridiculous, and I'm gonna say this, right? Nobody from the US government in the audience? Uh, these two ridiculous bills in the U.S. proposed to um, essentially protect copyright. That was their alleged purpose. But in addition to protecting, protecting copyright, um, and I'm not, I'm not getting into that argument about copyright, but in addition to protecting copyright, um, these bills also went a step further and essentially would have um, instituted a censorship mechanism in the U.S., which we don't have at the moment. Uh, it's complicated. We do have other things. But we don't have a mechanism in place for blocking websites, right? So that's what these would have done. They also would have done things like ban the use of circumvention tools, which are the tools that are used to get around internet censorship. Now, this is kind of funny because the US government also puts millions of dollars into funding and creating these tools for use in other countries. But clearly, you know, we Americans don't get the same privilege. Um, anyway, these bills didn't pass. 
They would have, uh, but thanks to the efforts of thousands, millions maybe, people um, in the US and around the world, they didn't pass. And the reason for that was that people mobilized. Uh, somebody, and you know, the mainstream media will often say that it was Google, but I swear it wasn't. Um, somebody came up with an amazing idea to uh, have a blackout day. And um, some of you are familiar with this, probably most of you. A blackout day on the internet is pretty easy, right? Um, you get websites to join in, and then they put up a black screen that either is you know, just blank or has an explanation of why they're doing it. Uh, and then when you get to that website, you um, essentially you can't get in because it's blacked out, right? Um, it's sort of censorship in the face of censorship. Now, thousands of websites did this. You had major websites like Wikipedia and Google. They didn't completely black out because a day without Google would be terrifying for most people. Um, <laughs> but instead, they, you know, they put a little banner explaining that they were still part of this protest, which is pretty incredible. Um, you even had frankly, pornography websites joining this protest. You had um, you know, small businesses, you had websites abroad that in other countries. Uh, and it was, it was a pretty, pretty incredible day. Um, and as a result, these bills got scrapped. Now, I'm sure that they'll come back like Medusa and grow all sorts of other heads, but at the moment, they're dead, which is wonderful. Um, and so I watched this with a lot of fascination. You know, I don't work on US politics. Uh, most of my work is international. But um, I was sort of watching this and going, God, this is amazing. Why hasn't anyone thought of this before? Maybe they had, but I wasn't aware of it. Well, I think a lot of people agreed that it was amazing because over the past year, we've seen four other global examples of this happening. Um, Reem talked about it a little bit last night. Uh, some Jordanian websites did this last year um, to protest a bill that would have been pretty terrible for, for free expression in Jordan. Uh, we saw one in the Philippines around their Cybercrime Act. Uh, there was another one in Egypt recently where news sites blacked out to protest some of the um, uh, articles of the, the um, proposed constitution think. Um, <laughs> and so, and I'm forgetting the fourth example, but basically um, you saw people take this, this example and create a movement around it. Um, and I'm sure that we're going to see more of this. So why was this effective? How did this manage to turn into political action rather than just a, a sort of um, a symbolic protest? Uh, there are a number of different factors. I mean, I think one of them in the US anyway was the large scale of this kind of protest um, because everyone saw it. I mean, can you imagine, do you know people who don't go to Google on a, on a sort of daily basis, right? Even my mother goes to Google on a daily basis. My grandmother probably goes to Google on a daily basis. So if you're going to Google or Wikipedia, which also participated, these major websites, you get there and you see this explanation of why they're blacking out, you, your brain starts to turn a little bit, right? You start to think, okay, well, this must be bad if all of these websites are participating. You know, I'm not political. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving an example. I am actually kind of political, but you might say, <laughs> I'm not political, but you know, this, this seems like a big deal. Okay, what can I do next? Now, one of the things that these websites also did was they didn't just, you know, put up a blank screen because that wouldn't have really solved any problems. Uh, it would have just been confusing. They also had an explanation and some of them redirected to, um, well, actually a lot of them redirected to my organization website where we had put up an explanation um, and a campaign for how to call your congressperson for other actions that you could take against this. And so that day, the phone lines of Washington, D.C. were flooded with these calls because people, you know, in the U.S., we, a lot of us, not all of us, um, but a lot of us are kind of fed up with our political system um, and not a lot of people think to call their congressperson. But it, it can be an effective strategy, not for everything, but for this it really was. And people were picking up their phones en masse, calling their representatives, uh, and getting their point across. And I, what, from what I heard from the couple of staffers that I know in DC, they were like, oh God, what a day, it was awful. You know, we're, our phones were ringing off the hook, we we're running up and down the halls, and that's a good thing, right? That's, that's political action. Um, it was effective in other cases, too, in other countries, and I, I don't know that I can explain why as well as people from those countries can, and since in most of those cases we have someone, you should ask them. I, Reem, I'm, I'm sorry to do that to you. I don't know where you're sitting, but you should ask Reem about why it was effective in Jordan. Well, not effective yet, but it was effective in getting people mobilized, right? You got a lot more attention for it. You got people to, to sort of begin to understand the issue, and now you have people mobilizing around this. Now, will it be effective in the end? I don't know, it's a different political system for one thing, um, but it got people's attention and that's the most important point there. Um, I just wanna give one other fun example because I know that there are a couple people from Palestine in the audience. Uh, and this is a personal story, which I'm not taking credit, believe me, but this is a really cool one. So 
About a year ago, I'm in the airport about to board a flight. My phone rings, and it's an unknown number, but it's, it's a Palestinian number. And I'm like, huh. So I answer it, and it's a journalist. And he says, you know, there's something strange going on. I've noticed that there are about eight websites that are blocked. And that's never really happened before in the West Bank anyway. I said, OK, um, how do you know that they're blocked? So he's like, well, you know, I don't really. They're kind of redirecting to a 404 error, which is you know, pretty common for trying to uh, hide the fact that you're censoring a website. And uh, I said, OK, well, I don't know how I can help you. I mean, I'm not very technical, to be honest. Uh, so I, instead, I put him in touch with someone who was. Uh, not naming names, but uh, someone who really knows their stuff on this. And uh, the two of them connected. And within less than 24 hours, they had confirmed that, yes, these websites were being blocked. And hilariously enough, they were being blocked using free um, software that was developed by the National Science Foundation in the US. <laughs> Yay! Um, and so this was the Palestinian Authority blocking websites that had been critical of Palestinian Authority corruption. Now, that's an easy target, right? I mean, that's what governments censor. They censor stuff that's critical of them, usually, um, and then so on and so forth. And so in the wake of this, you had a minister resigning, you had all sorts of negative attention, um, and you ended up having those websites unblocked, which was a great thing. Now, that's a pretty small action, and we're talking about a country that, uh, in this case, is fairly influenced by public attention. They don't want that sort of attention on them, and so it was easy to turn that around. Um, but that was another great example of how, when bringing this to light, shining sunlight on it, and saying this is not OK, caused a change. Uh, so. I don't know how much time I have left. Keep going. What's approximate? 10, 15 minutes? Great. OK, cool. Uh, <laughs> so um, excellent. Take a breath. Can we just sing again? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> just making sure you're all awake. OK, cool. So you know, there are other examples of this from all over the world. but. I don't want to prescribe one thing, because when you look at different political systems and different means of censorship and different ways and different types of things that different governments block, it's not all clear. It's not all black and white about how to fight it, right? You've got different processes, different means of activism, and it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So what worked in the US, calling your representative, is probably not going to work in Jordan, for example. It's probably not going to work in Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and so that makes it more difficult. It makes it a little complicated. And it makes it difficult for me, working in all of these places all over the world, um, to kind of come in. And so what I do um, is I listen to what people want, right? So you, you trust in people who are living in a certain society to determine their own path in fighting against censorship. And then you do whatever you can to support that. Um, and that's my method. I think it works fairly well, and you give a little guidance here and there. Um, but I think that what, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. Um, basically, what I'm trying to say is um, you, know, you don't want to take a solution from the US or from a, I hesitate to use the word real democracy, but um, you don't want to take an example that works in a situation like that and place it on China because it's not going to work there. Um, and we've seen that. And so what are people doing in different places? Um, there are all sorts of you know, wonderful things. And uh, if you look at the history of, of how people fought against censorship in Tunisia, right? Um, all of these different little subversions, these different great um, kind of sneaky methods of getting people's attention, we're seeing echoes of that all over the world. The blackouts are another great example. We're seeing this method taken and adapted to fit a local context. Um, and so when this happened in Egypt, it was just news websites. It wasn't a full-scale blackout, but it was the websites that would have been directly affected by the law taking this and using it in a way that worked for them. Um, and I think that that's kind of, that's what I love about my job is seeing all of these great examples from all over the world. Um, and also, you know, trying to sort of synthesize them and figure out how to then take them and, and I don't want to say teach them, but for lack of a better word, teach them elsewhere. Um, so I've, I've sort of um, come short in my speech on time. I can keep talking. <laughs> but uh, basically, if you look at the way internet censorship is happening right now, 
The other scary thing is while we're seeing activists learning from each other from state to state, we're also seeing states learning from each other. Um, and I, I can't stress this point enough. I know that a lot of people in the room are involved in, in this sort of activism, which is why I'm hesitant to sort of get into it, because I know that we all have different opinions. But if you look at the surveillance that's happening, for example, you see governments you know had had sort of started using these technologies built often in western countries often in europe often in the us um and then sort of passing these along passing along their ideas of how to crack down on a protest or how to surveil you know a, a society in large scale and we heard a couple examples of these last night actually from thailand i think about learning um learning from one another and governments learning from one another in terms of protest and cracking down on that um and i think that that's sort of where the fight gets a little terrifying, and I think that that's where we need more of this. What's happening in this room, what's happening tomorrow and the next day, more of this sharing of knowledge across countries, because even though the ways of fighting these things are different, differ from context to context, um, the fact that states are now learning from one another, the fact that, um, I like to say from one big brother to another, if that resonates with anyone. Um, the fact that that's happening means that we now have to start sharing tactics in a broader way. We need to start learning from each other, learning what our governments are doing, um, and then sharing those different mechanisms for protesting that, for fighting against it, with each other, and crossing that bridge. And so yes, it's true that what works for one person, what works for one place, will not necessarily work for the other, but there is sort of a universality to this. Um, and so I can't stress that enough. When you're having these conversations over the next couple of days, share those tactics. Yeah, thanks.